is the AP X-ray of his uh, right shoulder. Um, so I'm going to pick one of the residents. Um, is Dr. Phil Hichet here? Uh, yeah, hey, Dr. Ree. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so can you describe what you're seeing on this image? And also uh, let me know when you want to see the other views. Uh, yeah, so we have a single EP of a right shoulder. Um, there is a uh, minimally displaced surgical neck fracture. Um, on this single view, the glenohumeral joint looks congruent, but we want to get multiple views, uh, including a Velcro to um, have a better look at it. And uh, here are the uh, transcapsular Y view and the axillary view. Uh, anything you'd like to comment? Uh, yeah, so um, overall, uh, looks like a surgical neck fracture, slight apex, uh, looks anterior, um, but otherwise minimally displaced. Um, so in a 69-year-old gentleman, I plan to treat this non-operatively in a cuff and collar, bring him back in a week or two for some repeat radiographs. Yeah, good. So uh, exactly. So uh, given that the fracture is minimally displaced, uh, the decision was made to treat this non-operatively. And um, here are some additional images. So uh, these X-rays are taken at two weeks and uh, six weeks uh, post-injury, uh, respectively. So uh, Dr. Ishii again, uh, can you describe what you're seeing on these images? Uh, yeah, so um, there's been further progression of deformity. So it looks like uh, there's been shortening and uh, the head's fallen, to, fallen into varus as well. Um, I don't appreciate too much healing, so... Um, I want to know how far out he is from the from the injury. Yeah, so the left uh, X-ray is a two weeks after uh, injury, and the right side is a six weeks. Yeah, so I'm worried that there's progressive uh, varus angulation at the fracture site. Um, have a discussion with him. I, I think at six weeks it's still possible to treat this um, conservatively. Um, I do think that is long term shoulder function would, is not going to be as great with this uh, if it does a heal in this amount of varus, um, but I'd probably follow him along with some repeat radiographs. Okay, so um, so at that time, a patient uh, wasn't very interested in surgery, uh, so it does uh, continue to be treated non-operatively, and uh, again, uh, the the image on the right side shows his x-ray at three and, months, uh, uh, three and a half months post-injury. Uh, clinically, he continues to be quite symptomatic with a lot of pain and is not able to tolerate uh, any forms of physiotherapy. And uh, as you can all see on this x-ray, this is a significant varus alignment, which is not that much different from his previous uh, six-week uh, post-injury film. And also there is a lack of radiographic healing as well. Um, so at this point, the discussion was made uh, with the patient about the treatment options and uh, decided to go ahead with the surgery. Uh, so getting back to you again, Dr. Hache, um, any investigation you would like to order before going ahead with the surgery? Um, yeah, I think a CT scan to better assess the uh, the bone stock would be helpful and have a better look at the tuberosities, although they look like they're reasonably intact. Good. So these are some, uh, uh, sorry, these are corona cuts from the CT scan. I'm going to run it a couple of times so we all have a good look at it. And uh, and these are the sagittal cuts. And sorry, I hope I can run it slower, but I, I don't know how to. And then these are the uh, axial cuts. Um, yeah, so, um, so by the time the patient was referred to our hospital, uh, it was around four months post-injury. And as you can see on the CT scan, it uh, demonstrated again the uh, varus malalignment uh, at the fracture side with delayed union. Um, so what are the uh, surgical options uh, at this point? Um, yeah, so, I mean, quickly on the CT scan, so it definitely looks like there's delayed, not, uh, delayed union. Um, surgical options at this point, you said he's 69? He's a 69, but very uh, healthy. Very healthy. Um, so surgical options at this point would be open reduction internal fixation, um, but I'd also be prepared with either a, most likely a hemiarthroplasty I'd want to have um, available if needed. And if he was 
um, a little bit worse off physiologically. I think he's starting to become, he's getting on the group that would potentially benefit from a uh, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty as well. But my primary goal would be uh, open reduction internal fixation. Right. Um, so at, at that time, we decided to go ahead with the uh, open reduction and internal fixation, uh, given that he's uh, physiologically young and a physically active patient. Um, he also didn't have any pre-existing shoulder problem. Um, any, um, um, any challenges you would encounter in the OR for, uh, for surgical fixation of this kind of, uh, kind of injury? Um, I'd want to have a better look at the CT scan. It did look like there was a bit of a, a bony void there. Um, I mean, obviously correcting that, uh, varus, uh, deformity is going to be super important and restoring your medial calcar. Um, so I think the, uh, the option of having a fibular stratigraft is, uh, that's a really good adjunct to help restore that medial calcar. Um, if you find that there's bone loss there and we can't otherwise restore it, um, I'd want to get some sutures into the rotator cuff because um, it seems like that's what's causing the various deformity and that can help um, reduce that deformity uh, as well. Yeah, so and, and as you mentioned, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, in addition to uh, freshening up the fracture site, dividing any sclerotic ends as well. Right. So as, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, one of the main uh, problems we, th we thought it would uh, encounter will be uh, would be the uh, the lack of a medial support uh, due to the chronicity of the fracture in a uh, in a uh, varus malalignment. Uh, so uh, there was no good uh, medial calcar support uh, shown on both the X-ray and the CT scan. Uh, and also because the uh, proximal fragment is in varus for such a long time, uh, the rotator cuff will be uh, quite short and contracted for a long time. So this would make it difficult to correct the uh, uh, varus uh, malalignment. Um, so in the OR, um, we did a, a standard delta pectoral approach to expose a fracture. Uh, after suturing the rotator cuff tendons at its insertion with heavy non-absorbable sutures, uh, we bluntly dissected to release the subrocomial space uh, so that we, we can mobilize the proximal fragment and correct the varus the deformity. Uh, then we placed the fibular strut allograft to restore the medial calcar. Uh, we uh, preliminary held it with the K wire. Then we reduced the reduced the fracture and also held it with the K wire. Uh, we checked with the fluoro and we are happy with this pre preliminary reduction. So we went ahead with the uh, uh, fixation with the proximal humerus locking plate. Uh, and then the uh, this fixation was supplemented by tying down the sutures, holding the rotator cuff to the to the plate. And um, these are some of the uh, intraoperative uh, images. Uh, so I'm not sure how well everyone can see, but uh, you can see a fibular strut allograft um, adding the support for the uh, medial column. So yeah, good job. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Hishay. And um, just um, want to quickly go through another case of a proximal humerus fracture that uh, that uh, fibular strut allograft was utilized. utilized. Uh, and uh, this is a patient with a very uh, different demographic, different comorbidities. Uh, so this is a 58-year-old gentleman who is uh, quite uh, comorbid. He has a, a kidney transplant patient uh, due to a complication of uh, his long-standing type 2 diabetes. Uh, he also has hypertension, hypothyroidism, and some of the other complications of uh, long-standing diabetes, such as retinopathy. Uh, he fell from a standing height and uh, sustained an isolated right shoulder injury. Um, so these are the three views of the patient's right shoulder at his initial presentation. Uh, there is a displaced surgical neck fracture. The alignment look, uh, looks fairly good on the AP view, uh, but the transcapillary view and the axillary view show uh, that there is a, uh, the shaft is anteriorly displaced and there's a apex anterior angulation deformity. Um, so he was initially treated conservatively with a collar and cuff. Uh, his follow-up x-ray uh, show a lack of healing, and also he continued to have pain and was not able to do much with his shoulder, even a gentle range of motion. So at two months, the decision was made to manage his fracture uh, operatively. So these are the three views of his, ex uh, three views of his uh, right shoulder x-ray um, um, at around two months after the injury. 
So AP looks uh, deceivingly look uh, deceivingly good in terms of alignment, uh, but uh, still at two months there isn't much of a healing going on. And if you look at the transcapillar and axillary view, uh, the initial deformity we saw in these views that his presentation is uh, is worse than these views. So some of the uh, CT uh, images of his shoulder. So these are um, these are the coronal cuts. It's gonna run it one more time. And uh, these are the sagittal cuts. And the uh, axial cuts. Okay, so uh, this patient was taken to the OR for uh, open reduction and internal fixation. And uh, due to a severe osteoporosis, uh, decision was made to utilize the fibular strut allograft. And uh, these are some of the intraoperative uh, floral shots of the patient's uh, shoulder. And you will notice that the uh, fibular strut allograft was utilized uh, in a slightly different manner compared to the first case. Um, so, uh, fibular stud allograft uh, is gaining popularity as an augment for surgical fixation of a proximal humerus fracture, uh, in part um, in order to address the uh, high complication rates associated with the, uh, fixing the proximal humerus fracture, such as uh, screw cutouts and uh, varus collapse. There's some biomechanical studies showing uh, increased load to failure and construct stiffness, and also uh, shows that the motion at the fracture site is reduced uh, when the fibular strut allograft was used in conjunction with the uh, proximal humerus docking plate. Um, it is utilized to provide the uh, medial uh, column support uh, and or field a large capillary defect. Uh, most of the studies are either non-comparative case series, uh, but a couple of retrospective compare studies uh, showed some promising outcomes compared to the uh, standard um, locking plate alone. Um, the proposed indications across the studies were various malalignment, uh, lack of medial support, and or uh, severe osteoporosis. Uh, so at, at this time, I'd like to invite the panel for the uh, discussion of uh, surgical options for proximal humor structure uh, in terms of when to fix and when to replace, and uh, also discussion on use of the uh, fibra strut allograph or any other adjunct. Um, in dealing with the complicated or difficult um, proximal humerus fracture, and uh, would like to hear some technical pearls um, you guys use for uh, fixing the challenging fractures. Great. Thanks, Dr. Reed, for presenting those uh, two cases. I'm wondering if we could start off with uh, Dr. Rouleau and uh, two common themes in these uh, cases were that the uh, fracture was fixed uh, kind of like in this late period of three and a half months or two and a half months. Um, can you discuss the intricacies of when you may have operated on these or switched to surgical management and, uh, and why? Thank you. That's a very nice presentation. And uh, first I can say that the surgery were amazingly well done because it's not easy. Sorry. So um, always a good timing of a text to adjust uh, when I'm talking. So, uh, uh, my first message is first, um, the neck fracture, the surgical neck fracture is a very special family of a uh, fracture. And regularly you see that when it's not displaced initially, but it can move uh, later. So that's something you see regularly and it's usually moving in various. So initially I would not treat it, but it's really something that can happen. Sorry, I have the kids. Oh, so I, I heard that the Montreal Canadian had some goals. So that's why we have some uh, excitement here. I'm very sorry. Um, but when you have a case where that it's not healing, before talking about surgery, you always have to think about biology. So me, I always look for thyroid problem, vitamin D deficiency. And I know we are surgeons, but it's still for me the first step when I have a patient not healing. So that's really always my first step. Um, about my surgery of choice, then 
I will make things very differently from you because I revised a few strut graft, um, graft, strut graft uh, inside the canal to make an arthroplasty later. And it was uh, one of the worst surgery of my life. So I'm never using um, that kind of graft personally. In the first case, I would uh, have done uh, an open reduction with iliac crest bone graft and the nail because the nail is uh, more solid than a plate to prevent uh, recurrence of virus. And also it's decreased, it's less invasive in terms of uh, devascularization. When you do that kind of surgery, it's super important to keep the long head of the bicep because if you remove the long head of the bicep, you will remove the artery, the latcha artery. And also it's very important not to go in the uh, circumflex vessel area. So you keep that uh, area uh, safe. So me, that's what I would do, dental pectoral approach, releasing of the malunion, graft of the iliac crest, uh, reduced of the virus and uh, uh, a nail. Um, in my experience, I did that a few times. It's not a frequent problem and I always have uh, success. And in my experience, all these patients, they were always vitamin D deficiency, not just a small deficiency like 32 uh, instead of 75. Uh, or smoker, or all of the above. So, so that's my my comment. Uh, but I think the surgery was perfectly done, and I mean, it's a great. I'm sure the patient had a great outcome. It's just a question of choice. It's not uh, that I'm right or whatever. But that's um, that would be um, my preference. Thanks very much for that. I, I agree. I, I would uh, stay away from fibular uh, strut in this particular uh, instance for the same reasons, because they usually land on my lap to do the reconstruction later on. And it, it's not the same as a femur. Uh, coring that out is really difficult uh, and maintaining enough hoop stress for your implant uh, after that is, is difficult. So I tend to agree with that. Um, Dr. Adams, um, this is deceptively hard uh, fractures because of the delay at like three and a half months or two and a half months. It's very surprising how much the humeral shaft will scallop the underside of the uh, humeral head and leave you without any kind of uh, medial uh, calcar. Is there any tips and tricks at this stage that you would use to kind of bring the, the, the fragments out of varus? Because that's always one of the trickier parts of the, uh, of the operation. Yeah, uh, thank you for presenting those cases. Those were great presentations. And um, I think that these are beautifully done cases and um, highlight some of the challenges with these cases. Just going back, if I might, to the comment about delay, I think that we certainly see that and all of us see that um, in our own offices. And for example, distal radius fractures, we uh, reduce them. We look at the alignment. It looks pretty good. We follow them. The next week, it looks a little less good. The next week, well, it's not so much of a difference. And one of the, the challenges is I like to pull up the initial post-reduction films and then compare where I am because sometimes you can be, well, it's not much different, but you realize it's quite a bit different from where it should be or where it started at. And so a lot of the time I will find myself fooled uh, because I'm following the patient or comparing to the prior films when I really want to compare to the ones um, from the initial management. So that's just a trick I've used in my practice because otherwise I, I really get fooled a lot and find that I'm somewhere I don't want to be. Um, if I if I follow further along. Uh, to your point, I think that you've outlined that beautifully and you can see how that shaft has kind of scalloped away the bone. I, I do like using the fibular strut, but I do have lots of concerns as you've outlined if the patient ultimately has to have an arthroplasty. Uh, whoever does the arthroplasty will not like you at all. Um, when you send them the patient if it fails. So I guess the ultimate result is if you think that it's going to heal, uh, fine, do it. But if you have some questions. And I'd also like to echo the thoughts about smoking cessation and bone density and vitamin D. Um, people have talked about some fortuitous ways of looking at bone density. Um, if you're getting a CT scan, there's a correlation between the Hounsfield units and the glenoid and beyond a certain level, you can basically exclude osteoporosis. So to me, that is very, very helpful in my decision-making process. 
if I say, okay, well, you know, this patient clearly has um, osteopenia or osteoporosis, I'm very concerned about surgical fixation. Having that additional piece of information other than me looking at the x-rays and looking at their age and uh, sex and smoking history and like the second patient with his multiple risk factors, that can be very helpful. In terms of mobilizing the fragment, I think that that is a real challenge with these because as um, was outlined, you don't necessarily want to devascularize things further. Just as you outlined beautifully in your talk about getting into that kind of subacromial space and mobilizing the tissues, the rotator cuff is contracted. And so you're going to have to bring that down and mobilize the tissues to get to where you need to go. Um, so congratulations on those two great cases. Just want to ask, and, and I got to apologize to Bill for putting these reconstructions on his lap and they fail. <laughs> but, uh, uh, question for you, I to kind of highlight the point you just made. Uh, if, if you're doing a nail for this, uh, how are you mobilizing the tendons? Are you still making a fairly open approach to kind of get in there and, and free those up or because you're going delta pipe to put in graft, you're, you have access already or? Um, yeah, so yes, I do the delta pectoral approach for that because we need to graft. And anyway, since the URA study, I completely stopped doing any other approach for proximal mass fracture. And a good trick for a nail in that situation is obviously you make your release as much as we describe. You can also open rotator interval um, and uh, do some kind of blunt uh, uh, mobilization inside the joint with that approach. And then on fluoroscopy uh, with a, a Steinland pin, I try to reduce my virus as much as I can. So the pin is in the head. And then I pin the head in the best not virus position as possible in the glenoid. Then I, after that, I find my entry point, you know, depends of your nail you use. Me, I use a nail where it's coming on uh, the top of the head uh, in the cartilage. So I, I put my first pin and then I reduce the humerus by abduction of the humerus to the head. Okay, so my head's not moving anymore. It's reduced as much as I can in terms of creating more values. And um, I abduct the humerus on fluoroscopy, AP and natural, to control my flexion. That's usually an inflection and the virus. And after I continue my pin to uh, my guide pin inside the canal of the humerus, and I do my nail in that position. And doing that, at the end, when the nail is solid, obviously, uh, the, sh the shoulder will go back in normal alignment. And I would definitely here aim to over-reduce in some kind of valgus as much as I can. And I will try to impact the diaphysis in the head as well, because it will be a medial gap. So the medial gap, I will try to uh, impact it. Um, That's what Self-isolation. Self-isolation. Sorry about that. Um, any comments from my guest, Rick or Brad? Thanks. I'd just say that this should be prevented by hanging that arm out. And if that patient gets used to leaning on it, because it maybe feels a bit more stable, but... Uh, this has to be hung out, hung out, hung out, and then it's got a chance never to go to Varus. But once it does, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I always tell my uh, patients that have proximal humeral fractures not to rest their elbow on an armrest because uh, that's a killer. They get, they get home on the couch and they put their elbow on the armrest and it just creates this deformity. So you want to make sure that they don't do that. And uh, we heard about the nail and uh, iliac crest bone graft and plates with the fibular strut. I think if you're really stuck and you don't have access to those uh, types of things like fibular strut graft, um, one of the techniques would be to pencil the humerus, uh, the distal humerus fragment, and uh, take away some of the lateral wall of the uh, head so you could uh, correct the varus alignment and impact that and, and uh, basically telescope the two bones together to give you a great bony contact and that, that rely, uh, reliably gets you healed and also gives you some calcar support. Now it'll be a little bit shortened, but with the two porosities intact, that's really not an issue at all. So that's one of the tricks you can use 
uh, if you don't have all these fancy strut graphs and uh, you don't want to go to the crest. Yeah, I agree exactly with what you just said there, Dr. Rostetsky. Yeah, that, that would be my approach. I've gone away from using the, the allograft uh, for a lot of the reasons that have been uh, outlined, especially with the, the late reconstructions and my colleagues being angry with me for using them. Uh, and I, I've not seen a lot of great literature supporting uh, better clinical outcomes other than radiographic outcomes when using them. You can make the x-rays look great, but these patients don't necessarily do better. These, these are frustrating fractures. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very happy that I get most of the lower extremity trauma and I can refer on most of these because they're very frustrating patients to, to, to follow, I find. Even if their x-rays look phenomenal, it's, it's a really difficult rehabilitation process. Um, the only other thing I, I, I would have added, and it's a bit contrary to Dr. Rouleau, um, and, and maybe I should be learning a little bit more from her tonight, being, being one of the upper extremity experts, but I think it's really important actually to, to, to take the biceps tendon because it, it's such a pain generator. And anytime you go back in for revision surgery, whether it's a non-union or malunion or revising hardware, that thing is just absolutely caked in the in the bicipital groove it's not moving it's inflamed and, and so i i routinely take the biceps tendon and do a, a tenodesis it's one of the first steps i do when i get in there um and i'm releasing it through the rotator interval and uh, releasing it from the labrum and, and then taking it for for a later repair and uh, i've been happy with it but again i i don't do a ton of these so so maybe i'm uh, maybe i should be a bit more careful with, uh, with these patients I think it depends whether you're sub pec or at the level of the tuberosity. At the level of the tuberosity, there's less chance that you're going to hurt hurt vascularity. So those are some things to uh, uh, consider. I mean, these are all uh, super points on a difficult uh, fracture or malunion or a recent non-union. Uh, it depends on how you define it here. But uh, all, all super points uh, that people have made. And you can see that there's a variety of techniques because there really isn't any one definitive answer that reliably gives uh, patients a better outcome than different approaches. 